All right, let's get into the Word this morning. Are you ready? Say amen. amen. Talking about today, impossible. Gideon, a tested faith. I'm in the book of Judges today, chapter 6, starting with verses 1 down through 15. As we look at the pages of God's Word, the Word of God says, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, and because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them uh, the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And it was so, and so it was, when Israel had sown, that the Midianites came up, and the Amalekites, and the children of the east, even they came up against them. And they encamped against them, and destroyed the increase of the earth, till thou come unto Gaza, and left no substance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude. For both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, and it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drave them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Stop right there a moment. The reason they were in the mess that they were in was because they would not obey the Lord. This was a common occurrence with the children of Israel. God would bless them. God would be merciful to them. God would pour out his grace upon them. God would provide for them. God never left them. God never forsook them. But time after time after time after occasion after occasion, they kept turning that back on the Lord. And so the reason they were in the mess that they were in, the reason they had been in Egypt was because they turned their back on God. The reason they found themselves in Babylon was because they had turned their back on God. They did not obey the Lord. You say, preach, that's pretty bad. Well, you know what's even worse? Here we are in 2013, and Christians have the same problem that the Israelites had, that they will not obey the Lord. And then we wonder why God doesn't bless us. We wonder why God doesn't move in our life the way that we desire. Folks, you can't play with God. You've got to obey the Lord if you're going to be blessed of the Lord. God doesn't just arbitrarily bless you because you're his child. He blesses you because of your obedience. And it's, uh, it's crucially important that we're faithful in all things when it comes to God. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was an Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash, the Abazite, and his son Gideon, threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And I'm sure he was very nervous about what he was doing because, you know, Gideon, you're going to hear what the angel of the Lord called him, which the angel of the Lord saw him as what he was going to be, not what he was. Aren't you glad that God sees us for not what we are, but what we can be in him? Amen. Is anybody alive in here? Say amen. amen. Thank you. All right. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. That was not his resume at that moment. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all the miracles which our fathers told us of, told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us out from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked unto him and said, Go in this thy might. And thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent thee? Verse, 16, verse uh, 15, yeah. And he said unto him, O my Lord, 
Wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Here we go. All the reasons why I can't, I can't, I can't. When God says you can, you can. Amen. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Now, there are times in life when all is going well. You ever been there? We're not there too often, are we? <laughs> That's not a common occurrence in the life of any person these days. But down the highway of life, suddenly, seemingly out of nowhere, life throws us a curve. We have a trial or a trouble or a problem that comes up. And today we're going to pass and review through a portion there of, of Judges 6 and touch on Judges 7. In these two chapters, we find you're going to gain some insight to some things you need to know when you're facing those restrictions or those places in life that are very trying. So what do you do when life takes you out of your comfort zone? Don't we like the comfort zone? I mean, don't we like our own little, our own little habitation of our own little life and where there's no wrinkles and no rubs and there's no waves and there's no problems and all those things? Well, that's not the way life always is. We may like it that way, and you may even shut the door and go in your house, and then still trouble follows you there too, doesn't it? But uh, oftentimes the solution to challenge are given to us through life's most difficult situations. And realizing this, the nation of Israel was in a tough time of oppression at the hands of the Midianites who were their enemies. And so the nation had enjoyed uh, close to 40 years of prosperity and peace and the blessings of the Lord. And near the end of the 40 years, the sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And here's a lesson to be learned. You cannot do evil in God's sight and get by with it. You cannot serve the world and say you belong to God and expect God to bless you. And because of that, now they find themselves in the middle of, of, of seven years of oppression at the hands of the Midianites. I mean, here's Gideon crying out, you know, where are you at, God? Why aren't you blessing us? Why aren't you taking care of these needs? Why aren't you destroying our enemy? And, you know, the problem was not with God. The problem was with the Israelites. And so, therefore, each year during the harvest, according to the book of Judges, chapter 6, verses 3 through 6, the Midians and their allies would sweep into Israel, and they would take the grain, they would take their livestock, and thus they would ruin the harvest for the nation, and therefore the people were hungry and did not have nothing to eat. Uh, their crops were destroyed. Uh, their harvest was taken. Their livestock was uh, taken from them. And it was so bad that the people were hiding actually in caves and living in the mountains. And often uh, they were uh, hidden in what would be called strongholds, a place of protection, a place that, that they could defend themselves. What was Israel feeling at this low point of oppression that they were going through? There were two things that they were feeling. Number one, they felt abandoned by God. And understand this today. We many times in life become and get to the place that we think we're abandoned of the Lord. We're not abandoned. God never leaves nor forsakes us as the Word of God declares. He said, I'll never leave you nor will I forsake you. You may feel abandoned, but sometimes we're abandoned because we have left the Lord. We have left his presence. We have left his power, his provision, his protection, and we've wandered out into the world. Folks, let me tell you what. You can wander as far as you want to go, but you cannot wander so far that God is not with you. He will see you through, and he will bring you back. You mark it down. The second thing, it was the reason that they were feeling that this low point of oppression was because they did not know what to do. I'm going to tell you, when you don't know what to do, do what Isaiah said. They that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. You need to wait on God and know today that he is a God who's totally in control. So they were absorbed by the problems. Do you ever get absorbed by the problems that you're going through in life? I mean, they just become so numerous and become so unbearable and become so hard. Let me tell you something. They were absorbed by their problems. Uh, therefore, the people could not see what to do in order to have a remedy for their solution. I'm going to tell you there's a remedy for every solution that you, uh, every situation that you'll go through. And that solution is first you've got to look to Jesus who is the author and the finish of your faith. You have got to put your confidence and your trust in the Lord. Now from this text in verses 6 and 7, the people cry out to God for help. And you know, that's wonderful. And thank the Lord that he will hear the cries of his people. God never turns a deaf ear. 
But understand this, God only answers, though, in what he knows is the perfect timing. So what do you do when you find yourselves living with these restrictions in life? Several things I want to bring to your attention today. Number one is God knows the root of the problem. God knows the root of the problem. Sometimes, most of the time, we know it, but we don't want to fess up to it. We don't want to realize it. So, you know, we'd rather be in the blame game than to be in accepting the responsibility for our actions. And so, how many times do we find ourselves in a situation where we really do not know what, uh, you know, God is, is doing and how he's going to do what he's going to do? We find ourselves in a place of perplexity. The nation of Israel had to know why they were uh, in the throes of oppression. They had to know why they were going through what they were facing. The people were distraught, and they were at a low point. You know, our countenance reveals where we are in our relationship, doesn't it? You know, if we're down, we show it. You can try to cloak it, but it oozes out on you. Some way it's seen. We would call it, and oppression leads to a thing that so many people are dealing with, especially in these days that we are in now, called depression. Much depression, oppression, is, and is self-generated. And, and so, so many times, the, the reason for our problems is because of a lack of discipline, that we are not disciplined of the Lord. We're not disciplined by the Word. We're not living for the Lord the way that we should. Folks, we can come up with all the excuses. Well, I would serve God, but God's not looking for the buts. He's not a billy goat. God wants you today to realize there are no today reason why we can't serve the Lord. There is a way we can serve God in every capacity of our living. So what happened when the nation of Israel cried out to God? Well, God didn't immediately come and push the oppressors back. And I think that's what the children of Israel thought God was going to do. Oh, we just say, help God. Boom, God jump on the scene. The oppressors, the Midianites would be knocked out, and they'd be back to the normalcy of life. That's not the way God operates. God doesn't operate on the ways that we think. We've got to trust the ways of God that are higher than the ways that we think. So God sent an unnamed prophet. God would give them an answer. And you know, this is something about the way God operates he does a lot of things in a strange way. And so what was the key then to what God was, was doing to Israel in the oppression that they were receiving from the Midianites? God did not give the people what they wanted. God gave the people what they needed. And you know what? God's still the same today. God is, your wants are always lesser than what God has in store for you. We sell ourselves short. We're looking for the short cuts and the easy way outs, God doesn't always give us those things. Sometimes you've got to go through to get through to understand what God wants to do in your life. So they needed to know why the oppression was happening. When we're, when we're facing oppressive times, all we're looking for is basically for God to somewhat swoop down, make everything, the problems just disappear. And that scenario, I'm going to tell you, nothing is learned. Because you go right back to the same place that you were doing the same things that you were doing. God is a God of turnaround. God is a God of breakthrough. God is a God that wants to bless you. But you've got to learn to cooperate with what God's trying to do. We have to go through things to get to the place that God wants us. God has a perfect plan for every one of our lives, and we need to cooperate with his plan. How do we fix a problem then in our life? We must first know the real, what the real problem is. Uh, what was the real issue for the Israelites in their problem? Well, the real issue was not the oppression, but it was the lack of obedience that they had towards God. They had and they lacked obedience. It wasn't so much the issue. God permitted the Midianites to come in and do what they did. Understand God's in control. Even when you think, I don't understand why the devil's just hitting me left, right, up, down, backwards, forwards, every direction. You think, man, what, what, you know, maybe God's trying to get you to a place that he can bless you greater to learn you to a place of maturity and to get you to a place of dependence upon the Lord. 
So God, the devil will only, can only do to you what God permits him to do. The book of Job, 42 chapters, is a grand example of that. But understand this, God's going to work his perfect will. And when God works his perfect will, God is going to be glorified and his people is going to receive good. God's never promised you that life is going to be a cakewalk, that everything's going to be sunshine, roses, and no clouds in the sky. That's a part of living. Welcome to it. But understand this. They lacked obedience to God. You know, you would have thought through the generations and the generations of Israel that they would have learned the value of obedience. Well, they did it, and here we are in 2013, and Christians still haven't learned the value of obedience, have they? Second thing, God knows your abilities, your abilities today. In Judges 6, 11 through 16, God is about to offer a solution for the people through a very unlikely source. And that's the way God operates many times. Can you imagine, here's this coward, <laughs> Gideon, who's a wimp, and he's about to be the solution to the problem that Israel was facing with the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord comes to Gideon to announce God's calling on his life, Gideon challenges the angel of the Lord. Gideon is consumed with basically two questions rather than God's solutions. Just like what happened to Moses on the backside of the desert. God spoke to him through a burning bush that was not consumed. God said, this is what you need to do. Well, God, well, I would, but I this, I that. And he starts spurting out excuses. I'm gonna think, I think God just stands there and says, all right, get it off your chest. Say, all you're going to say, now you're still going to do what I told you to do. Amen. It's far better to obey than it is to sacrifice. So these are the things that Gideon, the two questions that Gideon looked at rather than looking at God's solutions. One, why are they in the shape that they're in? You heard the questions, you know, where are the miracles? Why is their provision gone? Why aren't you protecting us? Why aren't you helping us? And the second one, second one was, why hasn't God done anything about it? And a lot of times we think, well, when's God going to do something about the condition in my life? When's God going to do something about our nation? When's God going to do something about the complexion of the spirituality of the church today? And, I, you know, every week, every week, as I see more and more that's happening in the ranks of the church, the sicker I become. Honestly, it is clear as the handwriting on the wall. Uh, it's the fact that we're living in the Laodicean church age. Folks, if a church doesn't wake up, this world, this nation, is going to hell in a handbasket. Amen. Gideon had some strikes against him. Well, don't we all? I mean, really. One, he was the youngest son and not highly esteemed. He didn't have much uh, self-esteem. He didn't have much going for him. Secondly, he was from an obscure family. And third, Gideon's father was part of the problem for he was an idolater. He was an idol worship. Well, he was being what he had been brought up in. You know, a lot of times we blame what we are and how we are because of where we came from. That doesn't have to have any bearing on. You can grow up in a, in a situation and in a not a good family. And a, you name it. I'm not even going to go into the issues and the areas. But that doesn't mean you've got to be a carbon of what you came from. God wants you to be what he's called you to be, which is far greater than anything you could be in yourself. You've got to seek out God's plan. So what did God know then about Gideon? Well, God knew Gideon's capabilities, and God knows our capabilities today. Remember, the angel of the Lord called him a mighty man of valor. Well, you look at Gideon, and you think, there's no way. And he knew that. He knew he wasn't champion material. I mean, he was just a whipped out little guy hiding and running for his life and scared to death. But God didn't see Gideon for what he was. God saw Gideon for what he was going to become. I'm glad God doesn't see us even when people say, you're not going to make it. You're never going to achieve to be anything. Some of you grew up and your parents browbeated you to death. So you're never going to amount to nothing. I tell you, that just is a shame in today that a parent would do that to a child. You need to encourage your children. You need to put before them an example of what God can do. 
And even what people tell us we can't, when God says you can do all things through Christ, which strengthens you, bless God, I'm telling you, it can happen. And so how does God see you today? And, and how do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as a champion for Christ? Oh, preacher, I'm just trying to slough my feet through life and get by and just trying to make it each day. Guess what? You don't have to live that way. When God has given us today a life of victory, that we have a God today that's not a God of slump shoulders and defeat. He's a God of total, complete, absolute victory, and he's made you a champion. Start living like the champion that he's called you to be. And it was time for Gideon to stop feeling helpless, and that's what we get. I just don't know. You know, we slump our shoulders, we drop our jaw, we bend our knees, and we just kind of shuffle our feet through life and think, well, here's what I... Listen, when you're looking for self-pity, you're not going to get it. <laughs> when God's called you to rise up and be what he's called you to be and be the champion that he's called you to be, let's God square your shoulders. Bring that chin up. Look to Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of your faith. Remember who purchased your redemption at the cross. Remember what he has done for you. And remember, greater is he that is within you than he that is within the world. When we're living in that oppression of defeat and all the other things, really, honestly, you're just putting yourself and your shame and sh today upon the name of the Lord. That's not the way God wants you to live. God will not call us to do what we cannot do unless today he's going to be there with us. In other words, whatever God calls you to do, he's going to enable you to do it. So grab a reality of 1 John 4 and 4. It says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is within you than he that is within the world. No matter how small, insignificant, and how seemingly unimportant you may feel, today God can do great things in your life. Amen. Amen. Third, today God will give you the confidence to follow through with the tough choices that are needed. Now, God will sometimes lead you to tough things to make you and enable you to make tough choices. And so, before Gideon could cleanse the nation of idolatry, Gideon was going to have to do some house cleaning of his own. You know, we want to go out and change the world, but we better change and let God change us first. We better clean up our own house before we're going to go clean up somebody else's backyard, right? So Gideon was called to cleanse his own house. And many times the road to recovery starts where? With us. At home. It begins with us. Sometimes God will lead you to do things that are not popular with other people. And Gideon experienced that. And for the sake of time, I won't read it, but you can at your leisure in verses 28 through 30 of the book of Judges chapter 6. And, and Gideon's father then even defends Gideon because of what he has done in tearing down these, uh, uh, these idols that are worship. And so uh, the Bible says in verse 31, And Joash said unto all that stood against him, Will ye plead for Baal? Will ye save him? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death whilst it is yet morning. If he be a god... Let him plead for himself, because one hath cast down his altar. Gideon's father saying, if Baal is real, then Baal will take care of it. Baal was not real. He's not, he's a false god. And the people were not happy with what Gideon had done. I tell you, when you start stirring up the little nest of people's little worldly life, buddy, you got a, you got a hornet's nest on your hands, amen. But I'm going to tell you right now, God will stir your nest up, and God will clean you up, and God will get you to the place that you can honor him. When you're doing that which is honorable and that which is right and righteous today in God's eyes, it will not be popular with people. The message that I preach from this pulpit every Sunday that goes out by radio and television is not always a popular message because you stand for the truth, and we need more pulpits preaching the word and standing for the inerrancy and the infallibility of God's Word. When we're called to do drastic things, God will give us the confidence that we need to accomplish the task that He has got set before us. Look at the progression in Gideon's life, and let me hurry up here. When he decided to obey God, what happened? He gained confidence. Look at him on the threshing floor. He's 
whipped out. He's a whipped little pup with his tail tucked between his legs. But as he begins to obey God, bless God, he rises up. He becomes strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And again, for the sake of time, I won't read it. But in verses 36 through 40, Gideon is not convinced that he is the man for the job. So then what happens? Then he goes through the process of asking God for a sign. He said, well, preacher, I guess that's what I need to do. Stop right there. No, you don't. You don't need a sign when you've already got the word which today tells you who you can be and what you can accomplish through God. You don't need to put a fleece out. You don't need to test God. You don't need today to do as Gideon did. That was permitted by God that time, and that's it. But listen, this is not the end of the story. Gideon still lacked confidence, so he asked God to show him a sign and a sign and a sign. God did not scold Gideon, however, but God rather gave Gideon the confidence through this that he needed in order to accomplish the task that God had set forth for him. And the fourth area is this, and I'll be through here and give me, give me a couple minutes. God will give you the victory when you trust him. God will give you the victory when you learn to trust him. And so how many times has God bailed you out of something, some predicament in life, or helped you in some time of great need? I mean, the list rose on and on, page after page. God has, and Gideon rather, has an army of over 32,000. And all of a sudden, God told Gideon he had too many men. Wait a minute. There was a large army against, that he was facing with the Midianites and the armies of the enemy. And so God took him, and give you the short version, he took him from 32,000 soldiers down to 300 soldiers. Now, how was 300 men going to defeat a massive army of the enemy that they were facing? Their victory was not in their number. Their victory was not in their own strength. Their victory was in the Lord. Same thing David did when he faced Goliath. And folks, let me tell you, the victory would have to be by God's plan and by God's provision. And so sometimes things don't go better until we learn to rely upon today the God who totally can take care of every need in our life. So here's the bottom line. The same bottom line that David used on the battlefield against Goliath. The battle belongs to God. Every battle that you're facing of oppression, depression, defeat, discouragement, or whatever... The battle is the Lord's today. And how many times have we tried to go out on our own and we fall flat on our face every time? But boy, when you go with the might and the miracle power of our God, when you go in the supernatural ability of what our God can do, man, there's not a mountain that can't be climbed. There's not an enemy that cannot be defeated. There's not a problem that cannot be solved. There's nothing today that you can face that God can't bring you through victoriously. So remember, the battle always belongs to to God. So today, you're not alone. God's with you and God's for you today. And so folks, just come back to the Lord. And remember this as I close today. We need to start realizing that through God, we have the power and the strength and nothing will defeat us. So therefore today, we can proclaim, declare, and we can live this promise. Nothing is impossible to those who will believe. And you've got to put your confidence in the Lord, not your flesh, not in the world, not in your friends, not in your pocketbook, not in your might. You've got to put your confidence in the God because your battle today, your battle, I said your battle, belongs to God and the victory is yours in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for your mighty presence in this room today. Thank you for your promise. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you for every provision that you pour out. Thank you that the children of Israel were victorious because they learned the key to the blessing. It's called obedience. And thank God there's nothing too hard for our God. There's nothing that's impossible that our God cannot take care of. Maybe there are folks here today that are going through struggles and oppressions and depressions and defeats. But Lord, help us today to look to Jesus and know today we have a victory in the presence of our God. And we can proclaim, as, as Paul proclaimed in Romans 8 and 37, Nay, in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. Bless your people, bless this church, and we'll say to God, be the glory in Jesus' name. And all God's children shouted, Amen. Amen.